Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this month's paid virtual panel. We're going to start very shortly. Uh, just give a couple seconds for people to filter in from the waiting room. As a reminder, you can find uh, the full recording of this panel, as well as all of our previous virtual panels on our YouTube channel, um, on our website at pavecampaign.org, and on our social media channels at pavecampaign. I will go ahead and introduce myself and our panelists. Welcome again to PAVE's 122nd virtual panel. We have a very special topic today on pedestrian safety in recognition of Pedestrian Safety Month. My name is Caitlin Magney Miller. I'm PAVE's communications manager and I'll be the moderator today. And I'm gonna take a moment to introduce our guests as well and then we'll get started. Today we are joined by Mike Walters of Teledyne FLIR and Phil Magney of VSI Labs. So let's go ahead and get started. And I'm gonna start with you, Mike. A lot of people have seen your thermal cameras in various applications, but can you start by sharing a little bit about Teledyne FLIR and the work you're doing specifically in the automotive space? Yes, thank you for the introduction. And I'll, I'll start since we're talking on Pedestrian Safety Month to explain. Um, this weekend, I suffered a non-vehicle related pedestrian incident when I uh, stumbled walking down a dark sidewalk to throw out some trash. So it explains um, the, the bit of a black eye. Uh, but it's, um, it also explains a bit about the work we do at Teledyne FLIR. At Teledyne FLIR, we work on uh, thermal cameras. And while our eyes can see reflected light in the 0.4 to 0.7, micron range, a thermal camera actually sees heat and not light and is able to provide vision in complete darkness. We've been making thermal cameras at Teledyne FLIR for well over 50 years. When we started, the thermal cameras had to fit in the back of a truck. And today we make small thermal cameras that can fit in your mobile phone. Um, we're working specifically in the automotive space. Uh, we're working on a specific uh, thermal camera for automotive applications. It integrates a number of self-checking features. Um, it's designed uh, to have uh, automotive safety integrity level uh, B compliance uh, capability. So that just means you can trust the data from our thermal camera to activate the vehicle's brakes, for example. Recently, we took uh, this thermal camera and did some testing that we'll talk about today uh, at ACM, the American Center for Mobility, and uh, basically did some testing to look at, uh, can a thermal camera help or completely pass the FMV SS-127 regulations just introduced by NHTSA. And uh, we'll tell you about that today. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, Phil, turning over to you, uh, VSI is a firm that conducts research and testing in the ADAS and AV development space. Can you give us some background on VSI? Yeah, sure. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, yeah, we're researchers. Uh, we've been in this business for about 10 years now. Um, we mainly focus on understanding the enabling technologies uh, behind ADAS and automated driving. Uh, we started this business uh, really, um, really to better understand the perception systems and, and the rest of the stack that goes into uh, making these applications um, work properly. What makes us unique is our is the applied research we do. We operate test vehicles, um, by wire test vehicles, so the proper R and D vehicles, um, and we're able to 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 test out any type of prototype, whether it's a sensor or a computer or a new software algorithm or what have you. Um, and within the context of all that, you could say our specialty is is data capturing and recording skills for ground truth. Uh, we're able to um, uh, record uh, our data in a very controlled environment. And um, um, yeah, so that's that's what we do. Fantastic. Um, 
going to switch uh, topics to talk a little bit more about automatic emergency braking or AEB. Um, Mike, can you give us sort of a high level overview of the current state of AEB systems? Um, and can you talk a little bit about the strengths and the limitations of the existing technologies, especially in conditions where you might have low light or, or inclement weather? Glad to. Um, today's automatic emergency braking systems uh, typically use a uh, high dynamic range of visible camera. That would be similar to the uh, visible camera that's in your smartphone. And it's actually able to see very well in quite a variety of uh, lighting situations from low light uh, to very bright light. But there are some limitations. Typically that uh, visible camera will be either tied with the radar to give depth information, um, how far away are objects that you're seeing with the visible camera. And then um, often as well, there'll be two high dynamic range visible cameras. And these visible cameras are used uh, in a stereo fashion to get that uh, depth information. So you can tell um, is an object you're seeing in the vehicle's path and how far it is away and when would you might need to alert the driver or apply the brakes. These systems have made a lot of progress in the last four years or so since we did some of the initial testing. They're performing better in daytime and at nighttime, uh, but typically today's systems, um, advanced driver assistance systems or ADAS systems have a couple of faults. I think uh, most of us who's driven new cars have been annoyed from time to time when the ADAS system might beep a warning at us for no apparent reason. So we'd call that a false positive. And that's kind of a, a shortcoming that we're seeing. And then you mentioned uh, difficult lighting situations or inclement weather. When you get into very low lighting situations, you're going to have difficulty even with that high dynamic range, state-of-the-art visible cameras that are used in automotive applications. And if you're able to detect something in the vehicle path, you're probably not going to have enough distance to uh, safely stop the vehicle or have enough confidence to safely stop the vehicle. You can also have trouble in inclement weather, like a foggy environment. I think we've all seen when driving in fog, there's a lot of um, headlight glare and reflection back into your eyes. That same glare comes back into a visible camera, makes it difficult to see what's out there. And um, also, if you're driving into oncoming headlights or a rising or setting sun, that tends to be a problematic situation for our eyes and for visible cameras. Thermal cameras, as we'll talk about, uh, address many of these shortcomings are very complementary to visible cameras and greatly improve the system performance in these uh, difficult lighting or inclement weather situations. Absolutely. Um, Phil, given the concerning increase in uh, pedestrian fatalities, particularly at night and in some of these unique weather conditions, how do you see AEB and pedestrian AEB systems playing a role in sort of reversing that trend? Um, yeah, well, obviously with the mandates, uh, this one and there'll be more to come, um, NHTSA is, is clearly prioritizing ADAS uh, for purposes of reducing these pedestrian deaths. Um, and, uh, with that said, um, you know, most cars now have basic AEB functionality. Some even have pedestrian, uh, detection AEB as well. Um, and I think it's a matter of, of what's, what's been good enough. Um, and it's not like they are useless. Uh, the ones that are on the market today, as a matter of fact, the testing um, we did recently um, uh, kind of confirmed they have come a long way and um, compared to like three, four years ago, uh, systems are actually getting a lot better now at detecting pedestrians in daytime. 
Um, but while daytime used to be good enough, it, that's no longer with FMVSS uh, 127. Uh, with that, you now you have to be able to automatically stop for the car for stationary or as, as well as moving pedestrians. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, but with this with this uh, uplift in in AEB performance requirements, uh, and Mike mentioned this as well, uh, managing false positives um, is becoming even a greater issue, and it's really kind of a a delicate balancing act, act really, but you know, between precision and recall specifically, um, because what you don't want with an AEB system is a false positive, because that in itself creates a very hazardous uh, situation. So, so, so the goal is really to minimize those uh, those false positives as much as possible, um, and um, yeah, based on all of our testing. Uh, while a lot of the current cars out there do a pretty good job of stopping for pedestrians, uh, when it gets dark, uh, it's a different it's a different game altogether, and they fail quite often. Then, definitely, let's talk a little bit more about this testing that that you guys did recently at ACM. Um, so, Mike, you've touched on this a bit already. Uh, Teledyne Fleer has been sort of a pioneer in using thermal imaging and AEB systems. Can you talk about? Um, the advantages of thermal cameras over traditional sensor technologies? A thermal camera sees light or it sees heat instead of light, excuse me. Um, so we're looking at a heat signature that's emitted by everything on earth. And especially a strong heat signature is emitted by living things, people, animals, and such. So thermal cameras looking at heat do an exceptional job of seeing the things you most don't want to hit, and especially in conditions of absolute darkness. The heat signature of uh, terrestrial objects is in an 8 to 14 micron range, and um, our detectors are sensitive uh, to that uh, particular range. So um, it, it's almost like, and we'll show a couple examples of thermal images in a few minutes, but it's almost like the, the scene in complete darkness self-illuminates and you have a lot better situational awareness of what's around you, even when you're driving in complete darkness. Or because of those uh, longer wavelengths and it's, uh, not a reflective system. We don't have to emit anything. The uh, wavelength, the emissions are coming directly from the source. That's what lets us see well through uh, fog or dust, smoke, uh, these type of uh, hazardous situations. And as I mentioned earlier, um, when we're driving into a sun, uh, the sun just remains a disk in the sky and it doesn't cloud the image with a bunch of flare or glare or kind of the effect that makes you squint your eyes when you're driving into the sun. Really interesting. Um, Phil, coming back to you, from a testing perspective, how do these thermal cameras perform in nighttime or low light conditions compared to some of the more conventional AEB systems? And, and what are some of those key differences that could impact safety outcomes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, we have a ton of experience at VSI, uh, especially doing AEB stuff, uh, as well as working with thermal cameras. Uh, and we're just we're always amazed at how how well those how well the thermal sensor does at detecting pedestrians in the in the dark. Um, and we've we've done a lot of static tests recently uh, going out over 100 meters, for example, in complete darkness. Um, uh, the the thermal camera is able to detect that pedestrian. Um, and even with uh, even with headlights, you know, you get out past 50 meters or so and the headlights are not going to illuminate a human. Uh, they may barely touch their feet or so. Um, uh, so so I guess I guess that's the thing. It's just the um, you know, the the uh, the, the range uh, and um, you know, and the and and the confidence values are so high with the algorithm uh, that it's just a it's just a you know um, 
you know, it's, 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 it's a perfect, uh, situation, um, uh, to, uh, to apply AEB. Yeah. If I can just add on a little bit, Phil, I, I think it's good to note that the data format of a thermal camera is an image just like a visible camera. And so it's pretty easy to leverage all the advances in AI that we're hearing about and tune uh, machine learning algorithms uh, to make these high confidence detections that you were mentioning. All right, I'm gonna come back to you, Mike. Um, last month, obviously you started um, doing some of this testing uh, with these thermal nighttime protocols at ACM. Can you share some of the key findings from your testing? Sure. Um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully, um, you know, we can see what we, we, um, this, this is an example of the ACM track and we have that, uh, high dynamic range visible camera on the left and the FLIR, uh, VGA thermal camera on the right. So this is uh, complete uh, darkness. You see the headlights, the low beams illuminating the roadway ahead on the left, but no sign of the pedestrian at all. And on the right, you can see that uh, we can already identify the uh, pedestrian target uh, with the thermal camera. And this, this is an example of what I was describing earlier of the scene self-illuminating, if you will. You can see the human, but you can see uh, the whole environment because all objects on Earth emit this uh, heat signal that we're detecting with the thermal camera. Um, we'll move to the next slide. Um, this is a visual illustration of FMVSS 127. So it uh, describes the, uh, the test conditions that we tested. And you can see on the, um, the left, we have um, uh, kids and um, pedestrians crossing uh, the street in daytime behind a parked car. So it's an occluded, uh, a pedestrian uh, crossing behind a parked car. So the the pedestrian is sort of popping out into the scene rather late in the game and you need to be able to detect them quickly. And then when we're facing sideways, um, these detections generally come down to how many uh, pixels or elements of the sensor you have on target. And so a pedestrian um, crossing a street is a more difficult target than a pedestrian just standing in the street and you have much more of the body to detect. Uh, there are cases uh, second from the right of a stationary pedestrian, uh, a crossing case without a car occluding the pedestrian, and then a case where the pedestrian is walking in the direction of the uh, the vehicle. When we were testing the thermal camera, we used a thermal uh, pedestrian uh, target, and uh, this uh, uh, such thermal targets are, are really important that mimic the human uh, heat signature when doing this kind of evaluation. The uh, the test results we we achieved um, are shown in this chart. So the the VSI vehicle is in the, um, the first column here. And then we tested some uh, commercially available 2024 uh, models in these additional columns. The, the green box um, indicates that we passed a test. A uh, red box indicated that we failed the test. The test criteria that specified is one failure and you failed the test. And we did four passes for the passing test. So quickly you can see in, uh, 
in all the cases that we tested, the the VSI test vehicle that uh, Phil is talking about, which is drive by wire uh, with a high dynamic range visible camera, the fluor thermal camera, and a radar system, was able to successfully pass all of the FM VSS 127 tests. Uh, the the commercial vehicles today, again, are doing much better than they did four years ago, but uh, no uh, off-the-shelf vehicle today was able to successfully pass all of the tests. Phil, you want to add your comments? Well, yeah, uh, you know, we were you showed the slide on the on the test requirements, and the one that that concerned me uh, was the occlusion test, where the pedestrian I guess in our case, it was a child uh, that so you have a smaller, um, you know, a smaller body to begin with. And then it's blocked by this car that's parked on the side of the road. Um, now, fortunately, uh, this was only required for daytime. Uh, if you put that one in night, it would have it would the outcome wouldn't have been well. But um, I guess all the vehicles did reasonably well with that one, um, uh, frankly. Um, but uh, let's see, which one was that, Mike? Uh, that was, oh, the, the occlusion one? Yeah, that would. Oh, that'd be the child. Yeah, you see, yeah, yeah everybody passed that one, actually, which was which was great. Um, but uh, yeah, but uh, of course, when when night came along, everything was was quite a bit different. And uh, obviously, you can see the the red places and um uh, and and by the way, these these OEM vehicles that we chose for this, those vehicles are known for state of the art ADAS. So uh, we think we picked the best candidates out there to to test against. Really interesting to see some of those results and and also how some of the scenarios were set up. Obviously, very safety critical situations. Um. Um, let's talk a little bit more about this FMVSS rule. Um, Mike, I'll start with you. With this um, rule set to mandate AEB and, and pedestrian AEB systems by 2029, how do you think this is going to shape the adoption of more advanced driver assist technologies um, like thermal imaging in the broader automotive industry? Right. Um, for, first of all, I think uh, NHTSA is doing a really good job and other safety organizations like um, IIHS and PAVE are doing a, a great job really promoting the need um, to keep uh, pushing the standards. I always think to myself, if an automobile was invented in 2024, it might quickly be banned just because it, it would be deemed too ha hazardous. Um, so NIS is doing a good job uh, promoting the technology. I think the results that, that we uh, have achieved show it's possible to pass FM VSS 127. And I think thermal has a very critical role to, pay, to play in uh, passing that technology. Um, it's certainly generated a lot of energy in the thermal imaging um, technology sector, a lot of investment and a lot of innovation to really uh, drive the cost point of the technology to a place that it can be broadly deployed across uh, uh, vehicles as standard equipment. For example, at uh, Teledyne FLIR, we've shipped, shipped well over uh, 2 million thermal cameras in vehicles, but it's been over the last 20 years, and it's typically been an option in high-end vehicles. And instead of controlling the vehicle, uh, the thermal image has typically been displayed on the screen. And that's a bit of a distraction to add to the driver, even if there's an audio uh, alert or you're, you're putting a box around an object to say, watch out. Um, it's a much better scenario when you can use the um, the data collected from a thermal camera or any ADAS sensor and either be smart about what you're doing with the headlights, uh, directing the headlights, 
or uh, applying the brakes or taking some other evasive action, alerting the driver or taking some action to prevent injury. So I think um, it's gonna really be an impetus to drive thermal imaging and make vehicles safer. But by the way, about 75% of pedestrian deaths today do take place uh, at nighttime. And they typically take place on rural roads or roads that are unlit or very poorly lit. So um, we, we think thermal uh, imaging technology is right at the nexus of uh, addressing the root cause and solving the problem. Absolutely. Um, Phil, beyond nighttime driving, are there other scenarios you see where, where thermal imaging could really improve AEB performance? Behind nighttime, beyond nighttime? Yeah. Yeah, well, I would say any um, any time where the light is a challenge, you know, uh, visible cameras, uh, like if you're driving into a, into the sun, for example, you get massive overexposure from that. And so the, the visible can't detect a pedestrian. Uh, likewise, if there's a pedestrian, if, if there's if there's blinding headlights coming at you and a pedestrian is crossing that type of scenario, which we we also tested um that's that that's in, that, that that causes problems as well uh coming out of a tunnel or out of an overpass for example uh you've seen images you know the visible camera for a few seconds has to adjust and a couple of seconds might be too much uh frankly um so so yeah it's 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 pretty foolproof i mean to be to be honest with you and again we've we've tested so many different thermal cameras over the years that uh, we're, we're just astonished by it. Um, now you, again, you know, FMVSS, I think you have to look at what it's going to take to be good enough to pass that. Okay. And so I think the question comes down to, can visible cameras be better tuned to pass these tests? Possibly with better detectors, maybe, um, maybe matrix headlamps help in the future when you can start to, to redirect that. But uh, but at the moment, thermal is really the only reliable path uh, to FMVS-127. Um, although we'll probably see some competition from, from LIDAR and radar, um, even though at the moment those sensors are not practical for this type of application. Um, so, yeah, uh, we'll see. Um, and, and last of all, with respect to the bipartisan infrastructure law, you know, they mandate the establishment of a minimum set of performance standards inclusive of crash avoidance te technologies. Um, and so this includes pedestrian AEB, but it will also include other things down the road. USDOT is, is dead serious about saving lives through ADAS. Yeah, we just we just have a couple minutes left here, but I but I want to end on this question for Mike. Um, Pave, as you all know, is a company that really focuses on public education. What do you think needs to be done to educate the public on AEB and these upcoming mandates? And and what are some of the ways you think that consumers and drivers can stay informed about these advances um, in safety technology? Sure, I'll I'll talk about how people can stay informed in a minute, but. Given the state of technology today, uh, it's not quite there yet. So the most important thing any of us can do when we get behind a wheel is just drive, as NHTSA puts it. And that means leaving our cell phones alone primarily. I was really uh, moved by a um, listener perspective on public radio in the Bay Area where I live. A uh, listener, Becca Johnson, talked about a friend, Julia, who'd been struck in a sidewalk in Berkeley and subsequently passed away. Um, and she asked us to think about a loved one or the value that we place on a human life and make that our threshold for um, the amount of distraction that we'll tolerate while we're driving. Becca described herself as a recently reformed a lead foot and phone fiddler and recently reformed because of the pain of losing a loved one. So first of all, today we have to put the attention on driving and leave the phones alone. Um, going forward, um, the NHTSA website is a good website to 
uh, for consumers to check in with. Uh, there's information on safety recalls on the site. There's information about uh, new regulation. Um, other other websites uh, like PAVE and um, the IIHS website, I think, are good uh, websites to uh, pay attention to. And um, I'm, I'm really Im impressed by especially recent uh, advances in autonomy and think uh, we'll, we'll get to a way, we'll get to a place where the technology really uh, delivers a, um, a safe system uh, rather rather soon. Anyone who's been to San Francisco lately, for example, will see lots of autonomous driverless Waymo vehicles running around. And I think even though that kind of autonomy and that kind of safety has taken longer than any of us thought when this process started, I think we're, we're on the road to making that happen and just keep your eyes and ears open as consumers and um, you'll start seeing the trend in your neighborhood as well. Great way to wrap up. Um, we are sadly out of time, but Mike and Phil, thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, we will be posting the full YouTube uh, recording on our channel and our website later this afternoon. Um, so be sure to follow us on social media at Pave Campaign to see that as soon as it's released or check our website at pavecampaign.org. Thank you so much to everybody who attended. Uh, we absolutely appreciate appreciate your participation. Thanks.